Welcome everybody to OpenCV weekly webinar. And it's a pleasure to have a Jack Morrison with us today. He is the CEO of Scythe Robotics, which is a company that is building a robot that goes not on the streets or not on your car lane, but on your lawn. So it's going to be a fascinating new application area that we will learn about where robotics and computer vision are making great headways. So uh, welcome, Jack. Hey, thanks y'all for having me. Great. So we will go over, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, over your background and, uh, you know, you'll introduce yourself in greater detail in a bit. But before that, I just want to introduce people to Phil Nelson, who is the content manager at uh, OpenCV. And as always, uh, Phil, uh, short introduction. Hey, everybody. I'm still here. Um, as a reminder, we'll be doing Q&A at the end of the webinar here. So uh, use the Zoom Q&A functionality to answer your questions at any time during the show, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. There will also be a trivia question at the end, which I'll pick from the uh, slides Jack is going to do. The winner will receive a Scythe Robotics t-shirt. Hey, look at that. Uh, all right. So let's, uh, let's get started. And uh, Jack, uh, please feel free to share your screen and then um, uh, share your slides. Uh, very excited to hear about Scythe Robotics and the aut autonomous lawnmower. Sure. Uh, hey, everybody. Um, really happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, I hope this is interesting. Uh, look forward to answering your questions later. So I'm going to start off. Let's see if Zoom works for me. Let's start off by um, sharing our little intro video. Uh, give sort of the uh, quick rundown on what Scythe does today. So here we go. Say hello to the cutting edge all-electric self-driving mower that works with you for you. Scythe is there when you need it. One-time setup, no installation. Just map the property once and watch as Scythe cuts perfect stripes completely on its own. Scythe's all-electric drivetrain makes it the greenest and most reliable tool in your arsenal. It also makes it the quietest. Did I say tool? Scythe is so much more than that. With its 360-degree vision and intelligent perception, Scythe is half the work and twice the force. Scythe keeps you smart, keeps you safe, and above all, keeps you moving. Work smarter, cut cleaner, Scythe. All right. That's an awesome video, by the way. So Thanks. whenever I think about, you know, uh, computer, the future of computer vision and robotics, one of the things that I... Uh, keep telling people who are scared of robots, et cetera, is that it's not going to be uh, a competition between the two entities. It's a collaboration between robots and humans. And you saw that in that video. It's it's great, right? In that sense that, oh, the human is, we still need humans for, to do a lot of work and uh, it becomes a collaboration. It makes our life easier, right? Just like washing machines made it possible for, uh, it freed up our time, right? It's not like it took away our job, right? So uh, yeah, yeah I, I really love that concept. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the landscaping industry, and I'll, I'll touch on this in a bit, but <clears throat> can't find enough people to do this work. And so what we're really letting their people do is get more done, get out of the hot sun a little bit earlier, you know, instead of, instead of spending all day going back and forth uh, on the mower, they can do sort of more creative, higher value work, so. Yeah, without same for it too, especially with yeah. the the crazy heat waves we've been having on the West Coast. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit uh, more on Scythe in particular here, but um, you know, sort of broadly, I really just want to talk about um, off-road autonomy. I think there's a lot of applications even going beyond what we're doing at Scythe today. And um, that I think might be interesting uh, for some viewers and, and spark maybe some new ideas uh, for folks out there who uh, are working on other problems and, and looking for new things to get into. So, um, yeah, like I said, I'm Jack, uh, CEO, co-founder at Scythe. Uh, we're a team of about 30 folks just outside Boulder, uh, Colorado today. Um, we're hiring. Check out scytherobotics.com. Uh, we've got a link to our jobs page there. Um, we'd love to hear from anybody interested in uh, working on some cool robots. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail about how they work uh, later. Um, but, you know, I just want to touch quickly on, you know, if we're going to talk about off-road robotics, what is the, what is not an off-road robot? Um, and in this, I sort of am referring mostly to sort of indoor robots, on-road robots, and sidewalk robots, I think are sort of the, the most popular categories of autonomous ground vehicles today. So indoor robots, right? There's lots of applications here, huge opportunities, um, but they all share some things uh, relatively in common. You know, they, they operate mostly on flat surfaces, fairly low speeds. Um, the conditions that they're in are usually pretty uniform and, uh, and predictable. Um, you don't expect rain when you're inside. Uh, you don't expect puddles uh, to <laughs> sort of come across. Um, and generally, though, I've heard uh, arguments against this from some friends in the security robot space. Your floor is pretty smooth. You know, they're in warehouses or shopping malls, these areas that are made uh, for easy human traversability. Um, so lots of opportunities, but but sort of a, a known quantity when it comes to the environment you're working in. And then you've got your on-road robots. Oh, yeah, Satya. Well, I had a question about that uh, shopping mall, not uh, the gro gro grocery store aisle robot. I sure. don't know about th that one. What does it do? Uh, so I think that one's from Simbi Robotics. It's a shelf scanning robot. Okay. Um, so it helps manage inventories, uh, you know, when you need to restock, uh, looking for products that are out, that sort of thing. Interesting. And the top uh, right corner, that's a warehouse robot, right? Yep. So we've got, yeah, going clockwise from the top left, we've got the, uh, you know, well-known Roomba. Uh, in the top right, we've got Kiva Robotics, uh, you know, the Amazon warehouse robots, um, Canvas Robotics, uh, another Boulder, Colorado startup that's now actually part of Amazon as of a couple of years ago. It's in the bottom right. Uh, the middle is Diligent Robotics, uh, healthcare, um, sort of hospital service robot. Um, then Cobalt Robotics, blue uh, tower of a security robot. Um, and Symbi Robotics, uh, shelf scanning robot there. That's great. So lots when, we, when we got our first, uh, not first, actually second Roomba uh, recently, it, it almost made me feel that, you know, um, Robotics, I mean, these kinds of robots are, um, uh, it's like we thought that it would save us time, but the first time we used it, there were three humans, me and two of my kids, walking behind the robot just to see what it does. Like this went on for two hours, right? <laughs> and <it's>, yeah. <laughs> It was it was fascinating uh, just to theorize what's going on, and uh, it was very uh, instructive to watch. Now, now nobody cares. Obviously, it does its job aut autonomous, autonomous. Well, and you do have to. I have a, an off-brand. You know, it's a Eufy, I think, is the company name. But you, you do have to follow it around the first couple times too to make sure that you didn't miss any low-hanging wires or like you know reflective surfaces, depending on what kind of sensor array it has on there. So it, it's it's not necessarily a time saver right away. <laughs> right. Ask not what the robot, uh, what you can do, uh, what the robot can do for you, but ask what you can do for the robot. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, we've got the on-road category of autonomous ground vehicle, uh, obviously where a lot of money is going today. Uh, huge opportunities here, transportation, trucking, logistics, um, and huge opportunity to save lives. Obviously, driving is actually really dangerous, uh, despite how often we all do it and how little we think about that. Um, but it's a huge challenge, right? Very, very complex human-robot interaction challenges. 
Um, if you want to slam on the brakes at 65 miles an hour because you don't know what's in front of you, that would cause really bad uh, things to happen to you on the highway. Um, and so this is a, a tough problem and, and it's possibly going to be even decades before we see really, you know, what they call level five autonomous machines out there. But it's a very exciting category. Um, and then sort of my, my third category of non-off-road uh, robots is sidewalk robots. You know, they saw a lot of interest a few years ago um, making deliveries for DoorDash and Postmates and uh, Amazon Prime and FedEx. They all, all came out with their own robots. And, and what I think surprised a lot of people was how hard of a problem this actually was. Um, you know, unlike in on-road environments where you have usually fairly predictable terrain, sidewalks are actually a mess. <laughs> Urban sidewalks have roots that have pushed things up. You've got uh, uncertain curb gaps. Um, and if you slam on the brakes uh, with a sidewalk robot, no one's going to rear end you. So that is great. But you may make it into the press for uh, blocking up a sidewalk and, and you won't look very good then. And it is a, a major nuisance, I think. Uh, if these robots come to a stop. And then the, the final thing about sidewalk robots, you know, folks are really fighting for margin uh, with these business propositions. You know, you only make a dollar or two uh, for every delivery and, and you can only really deliver one thing at a time because they have to be small enough to fit on a sidewalk. So it, it's a tough proposition uh, to run, run a low margin business like that with something that's so complex to conquer. That's interesting. I, uh, I, had not thought about that, frankly. I was thinking that, oh, these are almost the ideal use case because the risks are so low and things like that. But uh, you know, after talking to you, it was eye-opening that these uh, these may not be the <laughs> right uh, one, you know, the right uh, killer app for autonomous uh, uh, robots. Yeah, I, like I with think these delivery things, a lot of them are loss leaders, so to speak. Hmm. Yeah, I think it became obvious after a couple of years that this was not as easy as we thought it would be uh, collectively as roboticists um, and that making money mattered a lot more than was hoped. <laughs> you really you need, really need something that can be a business because uh, the research and the development needs to pay off and it's not an insignificant amount of R&D to go into these sorts of products. Is that true about Silicon Valley as well? Just it, eventually, <laughs> eventually, things usually have to make money uh, or show a way to get there you're someday. Just, you're just showing your age, Jack. It's not true anymore. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, so, you know, if we've got all these other applications and indoor has some really nice things about it and on-road has huge opportunities ahead of it, why even bother uh, going off-road? I think this is something some folks ask. Like, it seems a lot harder in a lot of ways. Um but I think it, it comes down to a few things. One being every roboticist, I think ever since uh, the dawn of robots has heard about you know, the three Ds, the dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks that robots are really good at and are, are designed. Uh, you know, we sort of hope that that's what they'll take over for people. And I think you find most very dull, very dirty, and extra dangerous jobs uh, outside off-road, um, you know, everything from construction uh, to forestry where accidents happen all the time and, and, you know, cause loss of life and limb, unfortunately, to agriculture, which is just really hard on your body being out in the sun and, and landscaping as well, where you spend a lot of time out under the hot sun doing repetitive work uh, and it's tough. And there are unfortunately a lot of accidents. You know, this guy riding this uh, little riding mower on the left there should probably have a roll cage uh, over his head because riding mowers tip over all the time and it, it can be incredibly dangerous to ride them on uh, slopes. Um, I think the other thing is these are really big industries. Basically everything on uh, this slide is a, a $50 billion plus industry. You know, construction and agriculture are trillion dollar industries. The global logging market's a $500 billion uh, market. Landscaping's about $100 billion. Cattle uh, ranching is a $70 billion market. These are big businesses that have really big pains around uh, finding enough workers because they are dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs. If, if you can go to McDonald's and make $18 an hour, uh, like the starting wage in, in Boulder, I just saw a sign, you're not going to go out and work in the field. Uh, they're going to have a hard time paying that well, and it is substantially harder work. Um, and so I think that that means there's just a huge opportunity for robotics, for automation, for 
really interesting technologies. Um, but it is it is a tough market to find something that's achievable on a sort of short time frame. We've definitely seen a lot of these use cases in the uh, OpenCV AI competition this year. Uh, shout out to uh, Roquefort and uh, Benchbotics, who are two examples of teams doing these kind of agricultural uses. Very cool. Fact, uh, one of our previous competitor in the previous 2020 competition, one of uh, the applications uh, was uh, automatic lawnmower. Nice. It's, you know, I, I think it's a huge opportunity. We've got a few other folks who are playing in the space. Uh, in full honesty, it's not the most uh, novel idea. I think anybody who's messed with a robot uh, in 20 years was like, you know what, I'm going to build a robot lawnmower. Uh, no one likes mowing their lawn or very few people like mowing their lawn. But, um, you know, we, we chose a special uh, part of the landscaping industry, what's known as sort of commercial landscaping. So landscaping breaks down into sort of three pieces. One is residential uh, landscape maintenance. So that's like single family homes. You know, if your family hires a landscaper to come and mow your lawns and trim your hedges, uh, that's residential. Um, then there's design, build, construction. So, you know, building, installing, uh, planting trees and shrubs and all of that. And then there's commercial landscaping and that's basically everything else. So <laughs> maintaining uh, large open areas from uh, college campuses to parks, to housing developments, office parks, um, large highway medians or right of ways, municipal areas, all of this falls under the broad uh, about $55 billion a year um, market that is commercial landscaping. Um, and we're really focused on this because it's a huge opportunity. These are businesses that are struggling to grow. I think about 77% of landscapers surveyed a couple of years ago said that their growth as a business had been stunted because they were not able to find enough workers. Despite having over a million people employed in the landscaping industry um, with a I think about 60,000 of those annually coming from H2B visas. This industry just can't find enough folks um, to come in to wield weed whackers and edgers and ride mowers. And, and so we saw this as a big opportunity to help these business owners uh, get more done with the people they already have. Every single one of them uh, has said they just want to take on more jobs. They're not looking to shrink their crews. They're just looking to add more uh, power to the teams they already have. Um, and then, you know, the last thing is this is an industry that has barely seen technological innovation in a long time. The best tools we have are gas, very uh, noisy, very polluting uh, mowers and small engine equipment. Um, we think there's just a much better way uh, to care for all of our outdoor space uh, with electric and uh, autonomous equipment. You, could you talk for a second? Uh, how, do you, how much of that do you think is just how certain companies are so deeply entrenched uh, in terms of the equipment or versus the actual companies just not really looking for new solutions? Yeah, you know, I think it's sort of the the innovator's dilemma that uh, it's hard to do step change innovation as a large company. Most of the mower companies and, and landscaping equipment companies are over 100 years old. You know, all the name brands that, you know, Toro and John Deere and Cub Cadet, they are old companies and they have really, really wrung out every penny of cost from uh, stamping decks and bending the steel to make a frame. And they know how to make small lawnmower engines incredibly well, uh, you know, do hydrostatic transmissions. And so going outside of that mold is a really risky proposition for anybody in those businesses. Um, we see John Deere, you know, buying a company like uh, Blue River um, in California to do crop uh, spraying. And they've actually left them being very separate. Um, they're sort of this separate business entity unto themselves uh, because I think some of the folks at John Deere know that it can be very hard to have those mixed incentives to do something innovative, to do something that's not necessarily wildly profitable or um, cost optimized at the same time as having a business that's um, you know, caring about every penny that goes into a mower going out the door. Right. Yeah. So, uh, while we are on the slide, uh, uh, can we also, I mean, uh, the sensors that are on this uh, lawnmower, uh, does it come next or uh, should we talk about it now? 
Sure, I can I can dive into that. So this is our mower that you saw in that uh, intro video. It's a, a 52 inch wide, um, so three blade, three 18 inch blades, um, all electric stand on commercial mower. Uh, so stand on means there's actually a platform on the back. You can sort of see it there. You saw uh, our guy Jose riding it in the video. You can actually operate it manually as well as use it autonomously. Um, the thing navigates with eight uh, high dynamic range uh, cameras. So four stereo pairs, one on each side to give it um, stereo depth all the way around. It's got uh, a nine DOF IMU RTK GNSS. So really, really accurate um, global satellite positioning. Um, Let's see, the next version is actually going to also include 12 automotive grade uh, ultrasonic sensors um, and yeah, and then wheel encoders as well to give you um, sort of feedback from the, the wheels. And we bring that all together to get a, a sort of a fused picture of the world around us. Right. And the ultrasonic sensors, you know, most people are very familiar with, uh, I'm guessing uh, our audience is very familiar with vision sensors, but the ultrasonic sensors, are they used for very close uh, proximity, you know, uh, things that are close by? What are they used for? Yeah, they're used sort of as a, um, as a complement to the vision sensor. So we primarily rely on vision. That gives you so much rich information, as everybody here I'm sure knows. You know, they're, they're uh, sorry, RGB cameras. So um, we get full spectrum uh, info out of them. But uh, cameras can be tricky, um, right? There's just a lot of information. It's hard to always know you're um, getting the right answer. And so having ultrasonics as a second layer of safety um, just gives us more confidence that if anything does get close and it's unexpected, yeah. we have a very hard to foul sensor. Um, so these are ultrasonics similar to what you'd find in the, the parking sensors on a car nowadays. So right, modern cars have those little dots uh, that tell you when you're getting too close to the wall and, and they're very robust. You can cover them in mud, they can get wet um, and they work very well. And so in scenarios where our cameras may get a little bit of mud on them um, and they're working mostly fine, uh, we still want to have these ultrasonics as a, a fallback um, to bring all of that information to bear. Interesting. And what kind of compute uh, does does this thing have? What uh, do you use GPUs inside? What do you use? Yeah, so we're we're running on the NVIDIA Jetson platform. Um, pretty amazing, uh, you know, little <laughs> low power supercomputer. Um, but packing it all in on there, streaming all the cameras in over serial interfaces. So really, really robust, um, you know, low error, uh, low, low CPU usage um, way of getting all that data, uh, those six or sorry, eight cameras um, onto the machine simultaneously. And when you start building some of these things, right? Somebody, let's say, uh, uh, somebody who knows not much about uh, robotics, when they start building this thing, would, would you just use something like ROS, uh, Robot op Operating System, and then build on top of it, or uh, you start from scratch? Yeah, we use ROS a little bit. Um, we use it in a little bit of a different way, I think, than many uh, sort of open source, uh, maybe academic projects do. We have a very small number of nodes uh, that communicate with each other and then a lot of um, intra-process uh, message passing. So we actually write all our software in the Rust programming language, uh -huh. this is sort of a... Uh, and I think you guys had uh, Brandon on last week, who Tangram is another proud Rust uh, right. user, but... Um, you know, that's allowed us to be very confident in the performance and the stability and robustness of the software that we write. And so we've actually supported um, ROS Rust, which is the open source client library um, for ROS, uh, ROS 1.0 um, with Rust. Uh, and, and that's worked out really, really well for us. That's great. And this Ross is all Rust kind of sounds like a 70s like punk rock guy, you know. <laughs> Ross Ross yeah. Rust and the Rustettes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now now you're revealing your age, Phil. Um so uh, and in terms of uh, you know the uh, it is completely battery operated, right? There is a battery uh, the drive train is also uh, a battery based. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming that the computational uh, even though you have a GPU inside it and everything, uh, it's a fraction of 
battery power used by the mower itself for doing the job, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's one of the reasons we really love the, the Jetson platform is, you know, it peaks at about 30 watts um, at full load. And, and that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Our um, our blades are actually about 75 percent of all the power used. So propelling the machine is very low power. I think we could go uh, somewhere around like 50 to 100 miles. Um if we don't turn the blades off, like if you were to just hop on the back of the thing and start driving, um, you could go as far as a Nissan Leaf, basically, uh, wow. on a single charge. Um, wow. Yeah, because it turns out when you're only going eight miles an hour, or 10 miles an hour, there's not a lot of wind resistance to suck up energy. Right. Um, but the blades, the blades are very power hungry. Think about three, 3000 RPM uh, fans <laughs> that you're just spinning all the time, plus the load resisting the grass. Um, and so, yeah, they compute uh, a very small fraction. That would change if we were using, you know, a desktop setup um, and some of those, you know, 2080s that suck down a few hundred watts a piece. Um, that would be a very different uh, scenario. But those those have their place. You know, we use them. We love uh, NVIDIA desktop GPUs for training. Um, but for the inference side of things, using these um, incredibly efficient, low power uh, and very performant uh embedded computers are uh, just hard to beat. That's great. Sorry, I had hijacked your uh, presentation. Let's let's move on. All good. Um, yeah, so getting back to sort of general off-road uh, robotics questions, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's different about it than uh, what you might find on road or you might find uh, in indoor scenarios. And I think there's, there's a lot of things uh, obviously that are very different. And I'm obviously looking at this from the lens of mowing. Um, but a lot of this goes, whether you're in agriculture or construction uh, or forestry, you know, you come upon surprising obstacles uh, like puddles that maybe weren't there the day before. The, the landscape is constantly changing. You have uh, really hard, uh, difficult occlusions to getting your job done, like the tall grass in the top right there. Um, sometimes things are just so wet and sticky, whether that's, uh, the you know, the pine sap in a tree uh, that you're cutting down, the thickness of the dirt you're digging through, or the uh, thickness of the grass that you're cutting through, that it can be a real uh, surprising impediment to getting the job done. Um, you know, in the bottom left, we've got uh, a mower that's designed to ride a hill. So it's got two sets of wheels on there. Um, but if you're just a little autonomous lawnmower driving along, you may come upon a hill that you didn't realize was quite as steep as it seemed. And, and that can present some really interesting uh, challenges around the dynamics of the vehicle, around control, planning, um, and just staying safe because you need the machine to stay upright. And, and at a certain point, uh, all machines will uh, tip over and, and being very aware of that is really important. You know, you've also got surprising hidden obstacles like this sprinkler uh, control valve cover uh, in the middle bottom. Uh, and then finally, really dynamic lighting environments. So I, I talked about Scythe using HDR cameras, but uh, if you're standing out in a, a very well lit field and looking under the shade of uh, you know, a very thick canopy, um, your image can either be, if you're using sort of a, a regular um, low dynamic range sensor, uh, like you'll find in most machine vision off the shelf cameras, you'll see uh, either 255 uh, in all of the unshaded areas and you'll uh, get good contrast under the tree or under the tree and in that shadow will just be zeros. Um, you know, it just totally blacks it all out. Uh, and that's just not uh, something that works for us. That's not something that lets you operate safely because you need to be able to make that transition. Um, and so you need to have, you know, very conscientious uh, choices of hardware and software to process this data in a way that lets you be safe in all sorts of environments, wherever your, uh, you know, users decide to put you either let you recognize that you're in these environments and that you shouldn't operate or just have the ability to, um, to operate safely uh, through them. Right. Cool. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, what it's like being off-road and, and why we might uh, choose to build robots off-road, dive in a little bit on, uh, you know, how you exist as an off-road robot, how you can operate safely there. 
And I think the, the biggest thing that I've learned over the last few years in this really sort of solidified for me is that you need solution specific machines to most off-road uh, tasks. You know, with indoor uh, robots, you have companies like uh, Fetch, who makes an amazing um, mobile robot base that can be repurposed for lots of different tasks, be it from, uh, you know, diligence robot to gripping in warehouses to pallet transports. But in off-road context, it's often incredibly difficult to build a general purpose platform that you can just sort of slap a robot arm or something onto and and have yourself a, a functional robot. You know, tractors have very, very different characteristics than bulldozers. Um, and so you see companies like uh, Built Robotics in the upper right uh, adding sensors onto um, very large uh, construction equipment that already exists. And even though, you know, the bulldozer and the compact track loader that's way in the back there might ostensibly do the same thing, they still both have their separate purposes. And so you need to really think hard about what the equipment is trying to accomplish. Uh, you know, bare flag robotics in the bottom left, it's automating uh, tractors, um, making them safe to do uh, tillage uh, totally autonomously out in the field. Um, you could, uh, tractors are maybe one of the most multi-purpose machines out there, but still they have their place. You're not going to, um, you're not going to take a tractor and do the same thing that FarmWise's robot in the bottom right. That's a custom built, uh, weeding robot will do. You need to think really carefully about what you're trying to do because building a, uh, you know, one size fits all robot often ends up with a, it doesn't fit any size, uh, type of machine. Right. And, and uh, I mean, uh, people may be thinking that, oh, these really large uh, machines, uh, they, they will not become sort of autonomous, right? But actually, uh, in some of this, um, these applications, it's already taking place. For example, there's a company, one of our friends, uh, Traptic Robotics. Uh, Traptic is building uh, uh, a robot for strawberry picking. They just raised uh, a huge round of funding and they basically go through these strawberry uh, farms and autonomously pick uh, pick the uh, you know pick strawberries. And the funny thing is that, like you, uh, they also charge by the pound of strawberry they have picked, right? So it may be a good idea. Some I, I saw some people asking questions about you know what how much does it cost, right? Uh, what, what's your business model like for this application? Yeah. So for Scythe, uh, we actually charge on what I call a usage-based rental model. So we don't charge our customers upfront for these machines. Um, we instead charge them by the acre mode autonomously uh, by the robots. And, and that way, what I really like about this is that our incentives are directly aligned with our customers' incentives. If you, if you think about a, a traditional equipment manufacturer today, if they sell uh, a piece of equipment, be it a lawnmower or a tractor or a bulldozer to a customer, they don't see really another dollar of revenue until that machine breaks and either needs repairs or they need to come back uh, and it fails so catastrophically that they have to buy a new one. Right. Um, whereas in, in our model, in this uh, usage-based rental, we directly uh, make more money when our customers get more work done. And so the more successful their business is, the more they grow, even if they don't take new machines from us, uh, you know, if our machines just get faster and faster or we help them plan better routes over their, uh, over their days or they work more days out of the week, um, we both win. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, and it also incentivizes us to build the longest lasting machines we can. So many mowers are really only designed to last for a few years. Um, so many commercial landscapers will uh, use a lawnmower for two or three years tops before they resell it to a smaller company who uh, you know can't afford the larger upfront payment, but will put up with some pretty substantial repairs by that point, You know, entire engine rebuilds and stuff. And we want to build a machine uh, that lasts five, 10, 15 years even, because we just want it to be out there continuing to mow, continuing to make us money and, and letting us drive uh, autonomy and our customers' businesses forwards faster and faster. And you know, I think that is that is very common, like you were saying. Traptic does that. I know FarmWise in the bottom right, they charge by the acre. I believe Bear Flag uh, does similarly. Um, and I, you know, I think it just works out much better for customers and for uh, the vendors. 
right? And it's also, uh, it's a refreshing change from uh, the Silicon Valley model where they have planned uh, obsolescence. You, the, these things go, you know, they are designed to last two years, right? Um, and on the other hand, uh, some of my, one of my TV, the TV I had, it just would not, it refused to die, right? It was like 15 years, I just wanted to upgrade, but it just refused to die. Uh, it still is working after 16 years. Um, so uh, that's that's good good electronics, right? Yeah. Uh, and it still is functional, uh, you know, not as big as uh, some of the new uh, TVs we have, but, uh, uh, that's 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 a good refreshing change, right? Things that last. You are you have an incentive to build something that lasts for a long time, uh, and you are responsible for the upgrades, keeping up with the technology, and not the end user, right? Right. So I think uh, the incentives are really well aligned here. Yeah, you know, I think it, incentives matter. Um, it's it's all well and good to say that businesses should be in the interest, should act in the interests of their customers. But if they don't make money in the interests of their customers and people get promoted for a business making money, it's really hard for a business to continue to act against their own interests uh, effectively. And, and at Scythe, we wanted that to not be the case from day one. And so we are directly aligned uh, with our customers and, and we will choose our customers as folks, you know, that we align with ourselves. Um, because we want folks who are looking to grow, who are looking to take lots of these mowers, replace their gas mowers very quickly in, in large numbers. Right. So the, the second maybe obvious thing about uh, off-road robotics is they need to be rugged, rugged, rugged. Um, they run into a lot of really rough environments from, uh, you know, built, uh, <laughs> built bulldozers and uh, CTLs that are, experience very high vibrations and shocks um, to our mowers that, you know, can be in incredibly hot <laughs> uh, environments, baking out in the sun uh, down in Florida and Texas, they get covered in grass. I mean, grass and dirt get in just every single crevice uh, of these machines. And so designing them from the get-go to be able to handle that and, and put up with the fact that they're getting covered in grass uh, is really important. You know, getting the cameras, for instance, for us, uh, if you sell the cameras on our machine, they're not a foot and a half above the ground. And that's very intentional. Uh, anything a foot and a half above the ground is dirty, is grass covered, uh, gets water on it, gets spray. Um, and so our cameras are much higher off the ground and that lets us operate um, with a lot of confidence. Also, um, um, so, no. uh, in terms of, you, you mentioned temperature, do you uh, need to use liquid liquid uh, cooling in such cases? Because you know uh, the, the the temperatures can go really high. Let's say in Arizona or some some place, right above hundred degrees easily. Um, do you need to use uh, special cooling? You know we don't so far. We haven't uh, found that to be a problem even in in Florida uh, in the summer. Um, it does get hot, but we've got you know thermal dissipation uh, mechanisms built into the machine. So uh, our motor controllers that are some of the pieces you know they're pumping a lot of power uh, through them, and and that effectively has to get turned into heat somewhere. Um, they are mounted on aluminum plates that help them dissipate the heat really quickly um, and you know are mounted in such a place that as they're driving forward, that's pulling air, even if it's 105 degree heat, it's still much cooler than the maybe 200 degree <laughs> motor controller temperature. Um, and so that's pulling enough heat away to uh, cool those things down. Um, and this is a, another actually excellent reason why uh, really low power compute is important because if you're using 300 watt uh, GPUs, you are turning 300 watts into heat. Um, right. And that heat has to go somewhere. And if it's trapped in a tiny box, you're going to have a really bad day. <laughs> yeah. So the, the four GPU machine in my, uh, in my, the room where we have it, it's about a 12 by 12 room. And you can feel the temperature because my team, uh, they use it all the time for training. So it's like constantly used 24 hours a day almost. And you, when I, when I cross into that room, it's like you're crossing into a temperature. It hits you. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's three or four degrees above uh, the temperature uh, outside that room. Uh, I don't and, doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, we've got one of those uh, multi GPU rigs here and we keep a, a fan pointed at it all day, even right. with the fans that it has. And it has many fans built in. Yeah. Uh, we keep a fan trained on it because it gets so hot. And, and so you really have to think hard about that before you build a machine that you want to um, last a long time in these environments. You, right. you can't have them uh, overheating when they're uh, out in the field, you know, uh, uh, construction robot that's just stuck in place because its fans over uh, overworked themselves uh, is not a very good, uh, useful robot. Um, you know, I think it, this is probably also obvious to a lot of uh, folks who think about computer vision, think about robotics. But for me, uh, autonomy isn't the ability to go back and forth in straight lines. That's sort of table stakes. What, what being autonomous, fully autonomous really means is being safe. Um, being able to work in these dynamic environments uh, without cages between us uh, and humans, um, you know, like some of the warehouse robots uh, are stuck in, and instead uh, being able to go back and forth uh, with full confidence that we are tracking people around us, we're making sure we are not running uh, things over that we shouldn't be running over, like, uh, you know, pieces of trash that we turn into millions of small pieces of trash. Uh, that would not be good autonomous behavior. And so, like I was saying before, um, we've got eight cameras going all the way around, uh, plus these 12 ultrasonic sensors that um, ring the machine and, and provide us with sort of layers of safety um, to give us full confidence that we uh, are operating safely. Built robotics, same thing. They've got multiple uh, types of sensors on their machines to make sure that they are being safe, that you know they can detect people at a far enough out range. Um, and this gets tricky when your environments uh, are are quite so dynamic and and, um, and ever changing as uh, off road environments are. You know you can't rely on a persistent map uh, per se because the seasons change, uh, the lighting changes day to day, um, right. even the structure of some of these environments can change really quickly. Right. Uh, yeah. so, uh, uh, in terms of navigation, you know, uh, Roomba has has this uh, navigation uh, algorithm, let's say, right, which um, now it's it's much better. Earlier, it was basically random walk, right? It was just randomly cr crisscrossing, and eventually, it would get done. So, uh, so in these kinds of environments, what are the algorithms? You know, is it a Roomba kind of algorithm that it just goes? Uh, because for you, it's not just for a Roomba, it is sufficient that they cover everything, right? Mm -hmm. But in your case, that's not the only thing. You also have to maintain that. Uh, I don't know what the, those things are called, the, that the grass has been cut in a certain way. Yeah, the stripes. The stripes, the stripes. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we can't do a, a random walk. There are actually a few what they call robo mowers or auto mowers um, out there for home uh, home uses. They're huge in Europe, actually. In Northern Europe, uh, more than half of the mowers sold are robot mowers. Um, and they work by you, you bury what's essentially an electric dog fence. Um, you know, you uh, electric invisible uh, dog fence. You bury it around your yard and then the little Roomba-like robot sort of bounces back and forth until it's mowed your yard. Um, the problem is if it misses a spot, it's very obvious that it missed a right. spot. If your Roomba misses a spot, unless your you know entire house is covered in sand, it's not very obvious. <laughs> uh, it'll get it the next day um, and, and it'll sort of average out over time. Um, but in mowing, especially on these commercial properties, um, Property managers, property owners, uh, residents really like to see those stripes. Um, and you need to not actually, it's even more complicated than that, you need to not be laying the same stripes down day after day because that'll actually damage the grass. You'll push the grass down. The Oops. Uh-oh, we lost Jack. I mean, his slides are here. <laughs> <laughs> He's still here. I'm wondering. Yeah. Are, you, oh. are you back? Yeah, we lost your cool. lost your audio. How's now? Yeah. Yep. I'm good. Great. Sorry about that. It's all good. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we we lay down stripes. You know, we take in as input basically the um, perimeter, the boundary of an area, and then uh, based on what striping direction the customer wants, we're able to uh, choose a direction to lay those down and and accurately plan overlapping stripes um, to efficiently cover that area. 
that's great. And what what are the computer vision algorithms that you implement on uh, on the system? Uh, sure. Obviously, there has to be an object detector so that you don't, don't run over people. Uh, okay. There, there yeah. 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 We'll jump over here. So um, we've got a, a whole suite of uh, computer vision uh, sorts of things going. You know, we fuse both the geometric and the semantic uh, because in these sorts of environments that are rolling, that are not totally flat, you can't rely just on. Um, geometric vision or geometric, you know, LIDAR perception to tell you when there's an obstacle in the way. You really need to understand semantically that that's a styrofoam cup, even though it might be roughly the same height uh, as the grass that it's sitting in. Um, so we run full semantic segmentation, visual inertial odometry. Um, we fuse that with uh, wheel encoder information with GNSS information. Um, and, you know, the crux there is officially handling when we lose GNSS uh, information or if we lose uh, certain camera data uh, because it's blocked, we're up against a wall, they're obscured, they're fouled, whatever it is, um, and being able to continue uh, continue on as, as the machine needs to to get the job done. That's great. Yeah. And this, um, this is obviously yeah. happening at almost real time, uh, the semantic segmentation. Uh, and the path planning, et cetera, is all happening in real time. Right. Yep. Um, you know, this is this is a, a more achievable, um, I'll call it, uh, application than those on-road ones because uh, we can come to a stop. We can slam on the brakes and no one is going to rear-end us, and that's great. It lets us be very conservative, um, but we do still need, you know, sub-100 millisecond reaction times because we're yeah. cruising along at, at eight miles an hour maybe, and and we need to be able to stop quickly um, to make sure we leave a, a healthy margin of safety between us and anything we don't want to uh, to run over. Um, so, yeah, it's it's all happening real time. The cameras are streaming at, at 30 hertz and, and giving us really rich uh, visual information. Well, I don't know. I've taken up, it sounds like, most of your time. Do you all want to uh, move on to questions or anything? I don't want to run out the clock on everybody. Yeah, questions? I mean, we, yeah. yeah. Is there anything else that you uh, wanted to cover that's uh, not already? Sure. I mean, the so the last bit of being off-road is really about the planning and control. And, and this is where a lot of the nuance comes in. Um, and one of the big reasons that having task-specific uh, machines is so important. You know, in mowing, uh, we need to be very gentle uh, on the turf. We can't be spinning our wheels and tearing up uh, grass. If you have tank treads, you will tear up grass. You will do what's on the right with even slightly wet grass. Um, and then you need to understand the vehicle dynamics, the traction abilities uh, when you're on slopes or if you have one wheel on uh, concrete and one wheel on grass, they'll behave very differently. You'll get varying uh, amounts of force, uh, you know, impacting a robot, varying amounts of slip that can make it very complex uh, to naively maneuver uh, through an environment. And, and so I think this goes across a lot of off-road environments. You can't just always throw more force at it. Uh, you may end up doing some um, really disadvantageous things uh, to the world around you. Yeah, and then I'm just excited for what will come next. You know, I think overall there's uh, a lot of really greenfield opportunities here. You know, I have friends, like you said, Traptic and others who are working in uh, agriculture, farmwise, and bear flag, and construction has a number of companies working in it. We've got a few in the landscaping space. I'd love to see more in uh, whether it's forestry, forest management, wildfire prevention, or cattle ranching. Um, other sorts of uh, these industries that are way out there uh, and and can have a really big impact on humanity um, that haven't been touched yet. So I hope more folks can take up the, the mantle and, and lead the charge uh, into those spaces. Thanks. That's great. Yeah, so thanks uh, so much, Jack. Now we can open, um, you know, uh, let's, let's uh, look at audience questions. Yeah, uh, go ahead and unshare your screen, Jack, if you don't mind. Sure. There go. Um, so let's let's do a trivia question first. So, uh, as a reminder, uh, Jack has graciously uh, offered up a Scythe Robotics T-shirt to the winner of this week's trivia. Um, yeah, uh, I'm I'm kind of jealous. I want one too. Um, so during the presentation, uh, so the, as a reminder, the way this works is. 
I'm going to ask a trivia question, which is taken from Jack's slides. The first person to answer it correctly on my screen in the Zoom chat here. Um, whether you send it to panelists and attendees or just panelists, I, I don't really care. Um, it's just whoever shows up first here. So during the presentation, uh, Jack talked about the mini sensors on the side mower. How many cameras are on the side mower? Whew. All right. Uh, really, really jumped, like to, jumped to where you were going with that. On my screen, yeah, it looks like I see Partha here. The correct answer is eight uh, stereo, uh, four stereo pairs, right? So yep, well done, Partha. Yeah, way to go. Um, you will, I'll put you in touch with Jack to uh, get you your, your free t-shirt. Um, I can, can move. Oops, we we're so close, yeah. Todd, sorry. <laughs> We'll uh, move on to questions here now. Um, so the first one for me, uh, you, you talked about this a little bit on the during the presentation, but what's the fastest you've had one of these things going? Yeah, ours top out today at about eight miles an hour. Um, and that's pretty quick for uh, a thousand pound autonomous uh, mower on grass. Um, your typical commercial lawnmower will get up a little bit faster, but really you don't want to actually cut grass any faster than about six miles an hour. It leads to a poor cut quality. And, you know, we're really focused on doing a good job uh, for our customers. And I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm kind of an agent of chaos. So I always want to know, do you have any like, what, what are some like, uh, oh no stories uh, from attaching tiny swords to a robot? You got any good ones? Uh, you know, we've been very, very safe uh, with the blades themselves. We've, I've broken a number of pieces of the robot in various novel ways. Um, I've run it into, I think the most interesting that thing that happens there is just me running uh, it into stumps in my own yard accidentally. I'm uh, my my team likes to refer to me as the robot breaker in chief uh, because I have a knack for um, injuring our machines, uh, but taking them off curbs, sort of bending the caster forks, uh, all these sorts of um, robust testing <laughs> uh, things. We've we've done some damage to uh, the hardware. <laughs> I, I believe it. Uh, I, I remember. I mean, you you've always been good at breaking stuff. You were good at breaking stuff at Occipital. Yep. <laughs> Um, several people have asked about like how often or how long these can, these machines can run say during a day's work. And also, uh, in addition to that, uh, have you, does it, are they good for running at night? Yeah. So today we do about six to eight hours of mowing on a single charge. Um, so most of that podium, uh, that you saw on the machine is filled with batteries. And so we get a, a good amount of mowing 10 to 15 acres, uh, of mowing done on a single battery charge. Um, you know, for night mowing, that's not something we're looking at today. That's something golf courses are in particular very interested in, you know, they'd love if they could get mowers, um, off their courses, but that obviously requires some, um, either infrared, uh, perception or, uh, really big floodlights around the machine. So someday, uh, and it's really nice that they are quiet. So compared to a gas mower that runs at hundred to 110 decibels, our machines are typically around like 80 to 85 decibels, which is right. Cause it's logarithmic. That's actually a four X yeah. uh, decrease in, in volume. It's pretty dramatic. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and yeah, 20, 20 to 40 decibels is a huge number of decibels to be <laughs> to, like, that's, that's, you'd notice the difference by a lot. Yeah. Um, several people asked about, uh, have you considered putting solar panels on this thing? We thought about it, but if you run the math, um, panels for a substantial amount of cost would only get you maybe like an extra half hour of runtime um, throughout the day. They're really fragile. You need, you basically need the entire top of that machine to have solar panels on them. And, uh, and so it's just sort of not a, not a trade off that's uh, worth it. Some of our customers actually put solar panels on um, the roofs of their trailers. And that's really effective because you can have a very large, uh, you know, trailer top solar panel that charges a battery uh, in there and, and capture energy that way. But on the machine, we want it to stay really robust. Um, and so we avoid anything that that could break like those. Yeah, I, I yeah, personally think ahead, that Steve. solar panels, they work best, you know, when you're, uh, when you have installed them on static things like the parking lot, uh, cover, you know, the top mm -hmm. of the parking lot, they are great. And you go and uh, park your vehicle there and charge it, right? That's a great place. 
but on top of the vehicle, it creates all kinds of uh, nuisance. Yeah, yeah, they can. Well, be you're, you're adding to weight uh, in, in addition to you know some extra hardware that can go wrong with the charging circuits and all that kind of stuff. So it, it that makes sense. Um, several people have asked about catastrophic failures. Like, how does how does the uh, how does the the robot deal with say? you know, one of the camera pairs gets fouled somehow, or like it suddenly, you know, it feels like one of the wheels isn't turning. Uh, what happens then? Yeah, you know, that that happens all the time. And and it sort of has a, a suite of self-test uh, things to identify that it, it can't see out of its left side or, um, you know, the motor's not spinning correctly. And for some uh, sorts of things, we can call over the operator and ask them to help, you know, unfoul the camera, you know, wipe the dirt off um for some things if if really the motor has failed then that's just to put it back in the uh trailer and, and bring it on home what's really nice about electric machines um so i'm sure a lot of folks know is is there are way fewer moving parts than on a gas machine so on a typical gas mower um there's around 300 moving parts from, uh, you know, the internal combustion engine to the hydrostatic transmissions to the belts and pulleys that drive the blades. Um, on our electric machines, there's more like 30 moving parts. Um, you know, each blade has its own electric motor directly mated to the blade. Um, and then each drive motor uh, has its own wheel directly mated to it. And so there's much less to go wrong uh, on those machines. There's no, you know, they're all brushless uh, motors. And so their lifetime should be substantially longer than your typical internal combustion uh, mower. In fact, I was having a conversation, right, uh, you know, actually a decade back when uh, Tesla first started coming up with the uh, battery uh, cars, electric cars. Uh, so one of my friends made this comment that now cars have become a software platform instead of a hardware platform, right? Because all the difficult parts of mechanical, uh, all the difficult mechanical parts which can go wrong, and they're also very difficult to control, you know? Uh, it's not like when you uh, put such, uh, you know, the, the amount of uh, pedal you push it's proportional to you know uh, the amount of rotation you get, et cetera. So it's a difficult, hard, difficult problem. But now you have removed a lot, a lot of that complexity and made it into a software problem. Now it's a power management problem. And so uh, people should be able to contribute more. Software engineers should be able to contribute much more to, uh, to cars, uh, car development or car software development than uh, they used to be before with yeah. just the electric uh, drivetrain. Yeah, absolutely. You know, on our team, we have, I think, around 13 software engineers and, and five hardware engineers today wow. uh, to build this machine. And there's just a tremendous amount of software everywhere from, uh, you know, the firmware uh, through the various levels of computer vision and uh, robot software and motion planning up to the cloud um, and all the interaction that has to happen with um you know, cloud and web backends to uh, teach the robots where they need to go and, and share information between them. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's pretty interesting to see how, how much can be done and improved uh, just in software. Absolutely. Uh, I think we got time for one more here. Several people have asked about, uh, can you talk a little bit more specifically about the AI, uh, like the neural network formats and stuff that you use on the back end? Like what kind of, what's, the, what's your stack there? Yeah, we use PyTorch. Um, big fans of PyTorch running on the Jetson platforms. We use um, you know the TensorRT and uh, QDNN um, type libraries that give us some pretty amazing acceleration abilities. We work across the cloud stacks. We've got some things in, in GCP, some in AWS, um, some things running here locally. Um, all of the compute for the um, Robots, you know, all of the neural networks and vision processing happens on the device, though. So um, that's leveraging, you know, some Rust, uh, some a, a little bit of OpenCV as well, um, a little bit of uh, you know TensorRT and um, NVIDIA provided libraries, sort of a, a grab bag of the best of all the worlds. That's great. Um, so yeah, so uh, if people want to get in touch with. Uh, you, Jack, and ask you more questions. What's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you know, check out scytherobotics.com. Um, if you want to drop me a note at, at Jack at scythrobotics, uh, I'd be happy to hear from you. 
Um, yeah. And like I said, we're hiring, uh, we're a team of 32 as of yesterday and, uh, looking to be around 40 by end of the year. So looking for talented folks across, um, computer vision, across, uh, robotic software, manufacturing supply chain. So if you know anybody, uh, please encourage them to reach out. Uh, we've got our jobs page on the site and yeah, thanks for having me. You too. Yeah, thanks. Uh, in in the future, I think you should uh, consider having you know releasing some sort of a data set because this is a very unique data set uh, that people can get access to, and running a competition to solve your problem. Let's uh, let's say like the Netflix challenge or something like that. Yeah. So because you know it's not like people have access to this kind of data. It's a unique data, right? Exactly. Yeah, we've collected a lot and labeled a lot of our own data because it just doesn't exist elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that would be a very fun thing to do uh, one of these years. That's great. And thank you so much, Jack, for being with us and illuminating us with all the challenges and all the opportunities in this uh, really exciting domain of autonomous off-road uh, driving. So, and Phil, thanks as always for coordinating everything and. Uh, Pre, uh, you know, helping us with the webinar. Thank yeah, you so thanks much. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, and everybody, uh, you know, our audience, thank you so much. Uh, we hope to bring exciting stuff every week to you. Uh, see you next week. We'll see you next Thursday. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar. Please hit that like button, subscribe, and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop. This week's episode was brought to you by OpenCV Courses. Visit opencv.org courses to learn from the experts.